Hey, good morning and welcome to our July user group. And our uh, topic today will be redundancy best practices. And um, we're going to mainly focus on control logics today. We were, um, we were kind of a um, little over, I guess, maybe a, a little um, overreaching where we're going to try to maybe originally when we put our description together, we're going to try to talk about a lot of various pieces of redundancy, but we're going to really focus on control logics redundancy today and, and probably more specifically around the, the 5580, the new, the L8 controller. Um, so next slide, David. Well, uh, as we, uh, um, so first uh, I'll introduce myself, Wayne Welk, automation specialist with New Orleans, and I'm just going to introduce uh, today's topic and our speakers, and we're going to turn it over to um, our two specialists from Houston. So as you uh, might have just heard, this this session is being recorded. So we um, uh, we will make it available to watch afterwards. So uh, as as usual, we like to kind of promote what's coming up, and we have a couple of uh, tech talk topics throughout through the end of September. Um, our next session, which will be next week on the twenty eighth, is using the Plant PX System Estimator, which is a uh, a wizard inside of uh, Integrated Architecture Builder. So that's a great, should be a great topic. Uh, we'll come into August with lockout tagout, um, some lockout tagout discussion. And our second topic in August will be an Encompass partner update with Spectrum Controls. Uh, Spectrum Controls makes a lot of IO modules for a lot of the uh, Rockwell um, platforms, such as Control Logics, Compact Logics, uh, even the Micro 800. And I think they're going to focus on their universal gateway in that discussion. And then in September, we'll uh, have a configuring drives with CCW or connect, connected components workbench software. And then we'll wrap up the end of uh, September with a discussion on Control Flash Plus, which is a great new Control Flash tool if you have not seen that or used it before. And then for user groups, we do have uh, an August topic coming together and it's going to be a Rockwell information software overview. Um, there on August 18th. And our, like we said, all, our sessions are recorded and they're all published to our, the Reynolds Company's YouTube channel. So we wanted to just kind of promote that and let you know that you can go back and watch all of our previous sessions. And uh, also a little plug for the TRC Talks podcast. I, I meant to do that on our last session last week, um, which we did one on cybersecurity. We just wrapped up a cybersecurity a series on the podcast, and we also uh, share a lot of good technical information, and in that's in, in in the podcast series as well. So just a just a plug for that. Um, next slide. So two other things. Uh, Rock Live was an event that just happened last month in June, and just to to just remind everyone that those sessions are all available as on demand. So you can go to the Rock Live. Um, page on Rockwell's website. And if you didn't register previously, you can register and you can see all the content that was presented on demand, at least for six months. And uh, Automation Fair 2021 is shaping up to be an in-person event and it will be in Houston, which is uh, right here in our, in our own territory. So uh, that's gonna be November 10th and 11th at the George R. Brown Convention Center. So I think the last time it was in Houston was several years ago, 2017 timeframe. So it is coming back to Houston and uh, it is in person. So um, we hope to see everyone there. Uh, plenty of information about that will be coming out uh, in the very near future. All right, next slide is simply to introduce our presenters today. So Mike Masterson and David Newt, both automation specialists with the Reynolds Company in Houston will take today's presentation. So I will turn it over to Mike. All right. Thanks. Um, glad to be here this morning. And um, I'm really liking this topic because uh, it's something we don't probably address often enough. Uh, we're going to be going over some recommended uh, topologies when we're doing a redundant control logic system and some of the guidelines we have to follow. And I want to give a, sh a shout out to my counterpart in Dallas, Mark McGinnis, who actually found this slide deck. And it's one of the best ones I've ever worked with. I, I got to give him a little bit of a heads up because I wouldn't have found this on my own. All right. First of all, let's go with an overview. 
um, we want to take a look at the different um, topologies in there and what's been tested. Um, when we do a redundant control logics and we talk about our control network, we're, we're almost always talking DLR or, or um, a parallel redundant protocol um, tested system. Other configurations are available. Yes, we can support a simple star network, but generally if we're doing redundant controllers, we don't actually want to use a redundant, uh, or excuse me, a simple star network because we spent all this money on our controller redundancy. We need to put some effort into our network redundancy. So we're going to go through some of the references here and what's important to what guidelines do we need to follow when we're putting these systems together. Okay, next one. Um, this is a great page. Everything we're talking about today or this morning, these you can find this information in these manuals here. So at the very least, um, if you want, you can reach out to any of your rental specialists. We'll get you this page. So um, it, they're all good reference manuals and they'll set you in the right direction and make sure you can actually create a redundant control system that will actually work when it's deployed. So those are links to the literature library, but we also have some really good knowledge-based documents that, um, that um, help us out here or, or refer to what we're doing in our redundancy. Uh, David, next slide. So um, these are some more of the wide open uh, knowledge-based documents in there. A lot of you probably have seen them because as specialists, we point customers to these knowledge-based links all the time. But uh, we do have them listed here. Um, they're great review, easy reads. That's the thing. Um, you, you don't have to spend hours studying for these. A lot of these knowledge-based documents get to the point in a very timely manner. So uh, I want to make sure you're all aware of those. All right. So when we're designing a network and designing on a, a redundant controller, which direction we go is often based on what your customer requirements are. Um, we can always go parallel redundancy protocol uh, that gives us multiple uh, pathways. So, um, and zero recovery time. That is a great system. We want to use it all the time, except it's very expensive and it's it's harder to deploy. There's a lot more involved in deploying it. Or do we want to use something like resilient Ethernet protocol, which is a Cisco-based um, algorithm, which is a higher speed uh, recovery time? Or do we want to use DLR, which is a high speed recovery time? But again, it's a single point of failure on the media. It's, it's similar to like what we used to see in redundant control logics. So we have to make the, the decisions which best fits our application. Do we want the multiple pathways? Or are we fine with using a single pathway and just redundant media? Um, that is often it's gonna be decided by your customer. We can't help you that, but a lot of times we're, we're just going to try and keep up time of 99.99% uptime and any of these networks will actually do that. Next slide. Um, typical of what you've seen here is this is a typical redundant control logics network system using device level ring. Some of the things we need to make you aware of uh, in, in this particular system we can have up to, we always want to segment our upstream network. That's our network that's going to our HMI, our visualization network, our SCADA, our historian. Anything above the redundant control logics chassis is the upstream network in, in this diagram. So we always want to make sure we have an independent pathway up there. Hence, Every redundant control logics controller rack should always have at least two Ethernet cards, one for the control network, one for the upstream network. That should be standard design uh, 101 for whatever we do. In fact, a lot of simplex applications, again, because we want that network segmentation from our control network, we'll also have um, multiple um, Ethernet cards in the network. Um, we can put up to six Ethernet cards or EN2TRs into the controller racks. So we can segment six networks in each 
control um, each DLR can support up to 50 nodes. Now we're going to come back and address this because what constitutes a node does get um, needs to be figured out here. Um, well, actually, line item three actually tells us each E tap that we put on a fiber segment um, is going to be part of a node. So I want you to make sure you're aware of that. But E taps are also used for our media conversion on a DLR network. Um, we cannot use standard media converters. We need something that supports the device level ring algorithm and that ETAP is what works for that. The limitation on that right now is it's strictly multi-mode. So it, it, we can't support single mode fiber with the ETAP. Um, the, uh, we do support switches on the DLR network, but I, you do need to be aware, made aware that um, we typically we use 5700s there and not all 5700s support DLR. Um, one thing I'd say, if you go find the 5700 product profile, there's a nice eye chart that will tell you which 5700 layer two switches can support the device level ring algorithm. algorithm. Or obviously you can call your Rockwell or your Reynolds specialist and we can lead you in the right direction. If we are going to have to use single mode fiber for the ring, we're going to have to use a switch. Again, the ETAPs are strictly multi-mode, so then we would have to use a switch ring um, uh, design on our DLR. And in that, that's shown in this picture in line item or uh, at uh, item number four, where we have that 5700 um, right in front of the MCC buckets. All right, next slide. Um, any devices that are not on the DLR network needs to be um, will be in a star topology. In this situation, what we're looking at is actually the MCC in this picture is part of a star topology. And, and this is typical in a lot of MCCs we do. We do not run a ring network inside an MCC. It is a star. So quite often we'll have a switch at the end of the MCC lineup that will be connecting into our control network. So want to make you aware of that. Um, the uh, remote IO can be um, on the same or separate VLANs. Uh, what we do ask is that the primary and secondary controller chassis are attached to or on the upstream network connected to separate switches. This is to give us an extra layer of redundancy up there. Again, if we're going to the trouble of doing a redundant control logic system, we want to make sure we have the redundancy applied to even the upstream network. In layer eight, has in this graphic, you see there, if we only had the two chassis going to one switch, obviously that one switch is a single point of failure. So just want to keep you that, that in mind. Um, and um, also, if, if you can do a ring in the upstream area, but uh, we would not use DLR in that application, that would be some place where we typically would use something like resilient Ethernet protocol uh, ring, which is, a, again, it's, that's a Cisco ring algorithm. And we do want to promote NIC teaming um, on the servers and clients for the upstream network. That's shown up around nine. Um, that will give us some port aggregation and um, help us uh, with some bandwidth issues. Next slide. Um, this is more of a converge type network. And, and what you're seeing here is we're doing multiple rings down on the control network. So what you're looking at, we still have the same rules as we had in the other network. Um, one ethernet module dedicated to the upstream network. We still have the same limitations on the EN2TRs for control network, um, up to six uh, cards there, and each ring can have up to 50 nodes on it. Um, but more in spe specifically, if you look at the where we're coming off the controller chassis, we have some Stratix 5400s utilized there. These are in a layer two configuration. And that is specifically because the Stratix 5400 can actually support three DLR rings. Um, the 5700s can't do that. So we, we're sort of simplifying the ring architecture by using one 
switch for each controller chassis handling the three separate rings. Um, it gives us good consolidation. And I, I just want to say this is similar to what we did. Uh, there's a city of Houston wastewater or water job here for the Northeast water plant. This is the tip. This is very similar to the topology that they're using on that network. Okay, next slide. And um, again, the VLANs must be on separate networks. Um, no media converters used in the network. So if we do have on the control network, if we do have to use fiber, um, we do not want to use any sort of media conversion between the EN2TR and the chassis. And in this case, in this picture, the Strax 5400, which is at that layer seven, those two switches there, the link between the controller chassis and that switch there, we cannot have any sort of media conversion there. Um, not that you typically would, but in that case, you would want to directly attach the 5400 to that switch area. Or this, the 5400 will attach to the EN2TR in the processor chassis directly. Do not use any sort of media converter in that application. And again, in this application, we're still supporting NIC teaming, which is using multiple NICs um, on our, uh, our visualization system up above or our servers. That would be up there in the layer 10 area. Okay, next slide. Um, again, then we're doing just a deeper uh, dive on this network and, and hopefully we don't have any issues. Apparently it looks like we just lost power in our building, but my conference room is uh, still powered up. Okay, so we'll I can keep... hear you, Mike. All right, David, did you lose power? You're downstairs. I did, so... Yeah, I did okay. too, but I think we're still good. I think we're okay. still on. We'll, so good. we'll keep going. Um, so in here, what we're using is we're using a couple gateways attached to the upstream network. You can see that in area five. Those are uh, Stratix, again, Stratix 5400s that we're using has the gateways there. And you notice they're handling the multiple rings, but they're also handling the upstream connections to our, in this case, probably like a Cisco 9300 is what we're using um, as the layer three switches up there, the traffic cops per se. So, um, this is this is very legal. Um, you do that all day long. Um, again, it increases efficiency. It helps reduce the amount of hardware we're using. Instead of using a combination of gateways and 57 or layer two switches down below, the, the um, 5400s can serve both purposes. Um, all right, next slide. I think we're getting ready to go to some parallel redundancy protocol. This was the second on the DLR, if you want me to jump again. Yeah, go ahead and jump one more time because this does get a little redundant here. Um, our redu now we're going to talk about parallel redundancy protocol. This is something we've been so support supporting for basically about the last three years. This gives us redundant networks to each device. Now this does require a lot more hardware when we use these type systems. Um, there's going to be a lot more switches involved and a lot more specialty equipment. Um, for us, um, the same thing applies as with the DLR. We still only want, we want an independent Ethernet or EN2T or TR pointed to the upstream network. Um, the redundant racks or the switches for the PL, the parallel redundancy protocol will be using an EN2TP card. That is a, um, an ethernet card with two independent, or two ports on it, which are for two independent networks, LAN A being one port, LAN B being the other. Then those will go to two different switches. And um, then we'll do the connections off of that. Um, 
the switches for uh, in LAN area four do not need to be parallel redundant PRP type switches. They do not need to support that, but they do need to support, uh, excuse me, support jumbo frames because we're moving large blocks of data here. Uh, this does apply to uh, the 5700s, could be definitely fill that spot. But if we're connecting something to this network that does not support parallel redundancy, we have to put something called a, um, a red box there, a redundancy box. If that does support PRP, then we can attach that. In case five here, what you're seeing that, that's a redundancy box. You notice that it's connected to both LAN A and LAN B, so we have dual pathways, but because it is a, a 5400, we can support DLR off the side of it. So it does give us um, a uh, ring type environment to go with our sort of a redundant star type pattern. Now keep in mind, a lot of this is being done, the connection to the chassis are being done through an EN2TP card. Again, that's the dual port card. It's not your typical EN2TR. So keep, keep in mind there is some new hardware here in play. And any device, um, um, any device connected directly to one of the LAN switches. And in this case, if you look at LAN B4, we can see some point IO attached to it. That is not going to be on the PRP network. Typically, if it's not critical, th this is just fine to do. There's nothing there. Um, a good application might be uh, maybe a panel view. Uh, we don't want to have to attach it to the redundancy box because maybe if we lose it, it's not, gonna, it's not the end of the world. In that case, we can attach it directly to LAN B, but it will only be connected to LAN B. It has no way to traverse the LAN A. But again, depending on uptime, if it's not that critical, that works just fine. And plus it gives us the ability to utilize a uh, switch that might be un underutilized otherwise. All right, next slide. And um, one that was not shown in this illustration, but those red boxes, if it is a 5400, we could actually, uh, if you look at network six on the left side where we have maybe a, a couple of drives uh, and an HMI attached, we can actually support up to three rings off that one switch. So please keep that in mind. Um, the uh, LANs must be on the same net and VLANs and also most uh, be adequately um, separated. So where, where I'm going with that, if you're designing the network and you're building all this redundancy in the system, your fiber or your copper media, um, don't run it through the same cable tray because you're sort of defeating the purpose if you do that. So we do recommend using separate pathways, but in parallel redundancy, I, I, if, if you're using the second pathway is let's say significantly longer, that could cause some problems. So it is something we need to take and maybe possibly address. But a lot of these, design, this, this, that's a kind of a deeper dive on that, but that's addressed in some of the other uh, literature links that we come to, we've uh, I presented at the very first. So go back and review that or get with your uh, Reynolds uh, specialist and we can talk you through that. But um, just like control net, if you ever did redundant control net, you wanted separate pathways, but you didn't want one of the control net segments to be 500 feet longer than the other one or have maybe some, um, because that can cause a uh, timing issue. All right, next slide. Now we're looking at a converged network. This is where we're utilizing the gateways. Um, as you notice, in, in between the two controller racks where you see the one and two up there, that we have two gateway switches that are connected to our LAN switches. Uh, the gateway switches are connecting, are making our, our connections to the LAN A and B for our parallel redundancy and our upstream network up to our Cisco 9300 that might be sitting there. Um, again, the LAN switches do not need to be any special. They can be just standard layer two switches, but they do need to support jumbo frames. Um, again, being repetitive. The, any device that's connected to a red, um, a red box or if anything that doesn't directly support parallel redundancy has to be connected to a red box. 
And those red boxes, again, can support up to three DLR rings. All right, next slide. Um, again, we do have limits um, on, on our networks up to, um, uh, we should limit to no more than 250 nodes on our broadcast. Um, the, the way the parallel redundancy network works, any, by the way, is we transmit data out of both LAN A and LAN B. Whatever data gets there first wins, the other data is tossed. So um, they are two independent pathways down to that device. But um, any independent devices, like uh, again, look, look at I, line item seven, where we are item seven there, which is a point IO node that it can only talk to devices on, on LAN B. It cannot transfer or go across the network to LAN A. Just want to keep that in there. And also, um, we're showing the uh, the uh, red uh, the uh, 5400s at line eight. Those are layer three switches, and they are support. In this particular case, they're using a protocol called Hot Standby Routing Protocol, which is uh, we use quite often to connect to layer three switches in the upstream network. This is a standard protocol. That's why it's very important to know what your upstream switches are and what protocols they can actually support. They're not your typical uh, DLR parallel redundancy protocol. Um, a lot of times, because the, the, at the layer three layer, we're doing a lot more high speed stuff. There are a lot more protocols we can use like HSRP and there's others too, but we're not gonna go into detail on that. And again, we do support NIC teaming for our, all of our upstream um, uh, IT type equipment. We do promote that. All right, next slide. All right, we're going to take a look at some um, additional information on our networks. Okay, um, 5580, the, we just came out with 5580 redundancy with version 33. Currently, right now, we can only support one um, controller in the cha each chassis. Um, unlike the 5570, when we have up to two controllers in there. And in the 50, case of the 5580, when uh, we are doing that redundant, are doing this in a redundant system, we cannot utilize the port that's in the processor. So if we're using an L, um, a 1756L83E, in a redundant system, the ethernet port on that will be locked out in redundancy. This is going to change. It will eventually get opened up, but not in V33. Just want to make you aware of it that we will lose that port. Um, we don't have that issues with the 5570 redundancy. Uh, we can put up to two controllers in it. And, um, but for plant PAX, be, because we um, that is a, uh, a tested system, we do recommend that you only use one controller uh, per redundant chassis for a PAX system. But um, just standard redundancy, you can use up to two controllers with the 5570. And I don't wanna say it, but if you're still have 5560 redundancy, please go see your uh, Reynolds specialist because uh, eventually you're gonna wanna move away from that. All right, next slide. Okay, um, with the 5580, it, it's done me some favors. I can honestly say with the 5580, um, oh, bear with me, um, the V33 redundancy, uh, we do not support device net or control net um, bridging for those networks where it's strictly ethernet IP is what we're using for 5580. So if we're still having to bridge to um, device net or control net networks, that will push us over to 5570, the older controller redundancy. Um, so I, that actually is kind of a good thing. We don't run into a lot of device net and control net on newer systems right now. But um, again, if we see that, we will have to use the 5570 type controllers. All right, next slide. 
And with the 5570, we still support the device net and control net uh, Modbus. But just keep remind, keep in mind, we still do not put comms cards other than the Ethernet cards in the controller chassis. So if we are supporting Modbus control net or device net, uh, we will put them in the IO chassis. Just keep in mind, none of those rules have changed. All right, next slide. And since we're bridging those different networks, um, please make sure you configure your different networks like device net or control net for the actual data that you're moving. Don't, don't leave it set at defaults all the time because that might actually uh, slow down your data and um, create some issues for it. So keep that in mind. Always go back and address that network and, and configure it for what your needs are. Next slide. Um, bridging networks. Um, we do not promote that. And by bridging networks, and if you can take a look at this illustration or this uh, slide, what they're doing is on the remote IO chassis, you notice they're going from an Ethernet EN2TR in slot zero to one in uh, slot four, and then going to another chassis. Yes, you might be able to do that, but we do not support it in redundancy. We will tell you, you can't do that. So, but yes, you can call me and tell me you made it work, but that still doesn't make it right. So I want to make you aware of it. Don't try that. I can also say I've never seen this in real life. So no one's actually done this for it, but um, please don't do it. <laughs> Next slide. And then on the uh, fiber segments, um, a couple of rules of, th of thumb here. Um, I have used ETAPs as media converters before, um, just not as a drop, like using the, EN, or the uh, in this case, the ETAP 1F and uh, the 2F if you're just attaching one single device to the network. Kind of important to know, because I made kind of an expensive mistake one time in my life. Every time you put an ETAP on the ring, that will count as one of your 50 nodes. So um, one of the first DLRs I did, I was used, I thought I was being smart using all these ETAPs as media converters. Well, I also exceeded the 50 node uh, ring. So I, I do want to let you know it did turn out all right. We had uh, more than 50 nodes on the ring. Actually, we had about 62 and it still worked fine. But we only promote it up to 50 nodes. So keep that in mind when designing the network. Don't be like me, design it correctly. And um, if you're gonna be using ETAPs as media converters, just remember that will take away from your node count. So you might need another EN2T uh, or TR, an ethernet card in your chassis to separate the networks. And they're, um, again, only multi-mode fiber, but again, it's, it's multi-mode fibers. We don't care if it's 50 micron or 62.5, both are supported. And we're both good for two kilometers between segments on it. If you do need to go single mode fiber, which is we see quite a bit these days, we do have to use a, um, a switch uh, 5700 instead of the ETAP to, to accomplish that. Um, also, very important, decide what your ring speed is going to be. In a lot of cases, because we're using an EN2TR in the system, we're di it's dictated, we're, it's 100 megabit ethernet. But we do have new cards coming out and new IO adapters like for the Flex 5000 IO that can support gigabit ethernet. Please keep in mind, if you're putting it on a network, your SFPs are not auto sensing. You can't go from one gig on one end to 100 meg on the other. It's not like a copper port where it can turn itself down because we're dealing with different electronics here. Multi-mode fiber typically uses LEDs while single mode fiber is using lasers. So there's a huge mismatch there. So when it comes to ring speed, we need to make sure uh, you either design it for 100 megabits because all your components on that ring can support 100 meg or you do it for one gig. You can't mix and match on the ring. 
So just I want to make you aware of that. Um, it's not so bad now because a lot of it we're dictate we're having to use 100 megabit Ethernet. But as Rockwell brings up more product out, you will see them supporting more and more gigabit Ethernet applications. So keep consistency with within your rings. All right, next slide. Okay, um, indirect nodes. Uh, what an indirect node is is anything that's um, a, attached to one of the rings. Um, and it, what you're seeing here is the indirect nodes. Um, we're bridging off on the right side to three other switches. Yes, you might be able to make it work, but we don't support it. Now, inside of our MCCs, if you look at one of the MCC buckets, the one with the single switch in it, that is actually a star type network inside connecting to this case it looks like some VFDs. So just keep those that that is a star topology. There is no redundancy in that network. So if, if we lose that link, bad patch cord, we lose that RJ45 port, we will lose some of that network. So that's no way around that. But typically, that's how we do all of our MCCs. The MCCs are all done in a star configuration. All right, next slide. OK, um, using the Stratix, again, we've already uh, probably have killed this one. We can use uh, the Stratix 5700 in a DLR network. But like I said at the very beginning of it, there are only specific ones that do support DLR. Um, check with your, uh, your, your specialist, or you can go find the product profile uh, for the Strax 5700, and it will tell you which Strax 5700s actually support parallel redundancy or uh, DLR. Uh, just to let you know, um, they're generally all going to be full firmware and um, at least 10 ports. The, none of the six port switches support DLR. All right, next slide. Okay, the EN4TR. These are um, the redundant I.O. adapters. You, you might be looking at this and, and say, well, I don't see what the difference is. Well, we're using a ring, but you notice by using the EN4TR, where you, in slots zero and one of the remote I.O. chassis on the bottom, you'll notice we're daisy chaining from card in slot zero to slot one, then out of that. That is so weak. If we have any one single failure in one of those cards, we don't lose the rest of the network. That's that single point of failure part. And we're accomplishing this in a ring network. So that's fairly new for us because we haven't, the N2TR, we weren't able to do that. Um, so if this level of redundancy works for you, uh, please uh, keep that the N4TR in mind. Um, but uh, just remember, um, they each will count has a node on the network. So we have to watch our node count. If we're, we think we might be getting close to that 50 limit, we need to really take into account how we're doing this. And um, the, it points to the 3.001 firmware for this. Uh, a lot of this is, has been, was applied in and after version 31 of Studio 5000. Um, that's where a lot of this, these firmwares and network updates really took place. Okay, next one. Okay, um, let's go ahead and skip this because I've already talked about this one 800 times. Oh, um, again, we've talked about this, but why put a single, if we're doing redundant control logics for upstream network, put connect them to two switches. Yes, you can make it work with one, but then you're creating, again, a single point of failure for your upstream network. So best to have two switches there. And as we look at networks for the upstream networks, and I've actually done these both ways. Um, the redundant star versus the ring. Predominantly, we see some sort of redundant star uh, network going up to the um, 
upstream switches. In this case, that would be like, in this case, again, like a Cisco 9300. So that is typically what we see, but we can do a ring type topology. Typically there, what we'd be using is the resilient ethernet protocol. We're not using DLR in that application. DLR is really just a control network. That's our IO network. When we get to the upstream network, we're going to be using, um, you can use RSTP, which is a little slow, but REP is a fairly high speed network. It is a, um, it is a Cisco protocol, but um, a lot of their switches support it and other people support their rep ring also. And so that is available, um, but quite often, depending on how the, the way the architectures are drawn out, a redundant star is going to make a lot more sense. Um, all right, next slide. All right, uh, data server recovery time. This is a, has, has a lot to do with the factory of talk links on the upstream network. Um, again, with version 31.052, um, they um, have created some shortcuts for our data passage, let's say for our factory talk view system. Um, we need to take advantage of that because if we're using dual switches to the upstream network, any amount of failure, if one fails, it, it can cause a hiccup in the system. The shortcuts that are addressed, and they are, um, Dave, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, if you look at the getting, that factory talk getting results guide, it will discuss how to set up the shortcuts. So when we do have these issues, if something was to fail on one of the upstream switches, we, it reduces the time of the hiccup or the voting uh, for the uh, shortcuts on there. Please be aware of that. And, and if you're doing this, it run into the situation, and this is especially important for plant PAX applications. Please take a look at the gaining results guides because these shortcuts really do need to be set up so we don't have any issues with our HMI update times. Okay. Um, we've already talked about that a little bit. And again, uh, the multiple DLRs, different VLANs. Again, the only way we can actually accomplish this is we have to use a Strax 5400. 5700 only supports one DLR ring. The 5400 switch currently right now is the only one that supports multiple rings. The just released uh, 5800, only supports one uh, ring at this time. So that, that could change that. They could probably change that with firmware, but they haven't done that at this time. So right now the 5400 is the only switch we would use for this type of application. All right. And uh, just playing with redundant gateways. The, gate, the redundant gateways here are attaching, attaching to the upstream network and our IO network. So basically they need to be up there with the controller chassis. That's the uh, main gateway. And also if it, it just makes a really smart way of doing this, especially if you want to use a lower cost ring type architecture, the fact is you can support three, three rings off those can really help you consolidate um, some of your networking hardware equipment. Okay. All right, let's go that. Uh, now, where can you find all this information? Um, anytime you do, it, what I will ask you to do is go search PCDC Rockwell. It will take you to a web page where we, this is where a lot of specialists live that where we can pull up notes and information on various releases of Rockwell software or hardware. If you go into PCDC and type redundancy, it will give you the ability to take a look at the different redundancies that are out there and will give you the line notes that are available for them. This is kind of hard to see, but what I've picked here is just, I just typed in control logics redundancy and got all these, all these uh, pop-ups here. So I can find the bundle that's applicable, applicable to me let's say version 33 and pick the line notes for it. 
what the line notes are, if you go to the next page, David, it will give you all the release notes for that version of redundancy. It will go over your firmware that you need to have for your different components, and it will go over acceptable hardware. Before you ever start a redundant system, it's very important for you to take a long, hard look at these release notes. Um, generally, they run about five, six, seven pages. But um, whenever I'm trying to figure out a system, this is the first place I look to see what I can't use. Like um, in version 30 redundancy, I will quickly find out that I cannot use an L6 controller or I can't use one of the old SRM modules. It will be very specific what, what products can be used and what can't be used. So I wanna make sure this is one of the most important um, but easiest things to find before you start laying out any of your redundant control logic systems. With that, I think I'm about ready to hand it over to David. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, that was a lot of good information, especially on the networking side. Um, I'm, we're going to switch gears a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about some programming best practices. So we're going to kind of leave the network world and, and kind of jump into the program. We're going to keep this fairly high level. So if you have any more detailed questions about, about some specifics around, around some of the best practices, please um, reach out to, to one of your, uh, your uh, TRC specialists and we'll be more than happy to help you. Um, but for those of you that, that have not done a redundant system before. Um, this is a, a quick little diagram of, of what the program scan time looks like. So um, there is, in a, you know, in a simplex system, you just execute your, your programs and, and everything is good. Uh, in a redundant system, there's, a little, there's an extra uh, program scan time that's dedicated to what we call cross-loading. And essentially cross-loading um, is the time that it takes for the two controllers to synchronize with each other. Um, and, and so by default, cross-loading occurs at the end of every program scan. Uh, that can be changed. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, and th not only does all the, pr the program or the logic synchronize, but also the data behind that logic uh, synchronizes or cross-loads as well. And specifically, um, the, um, any of the outputs um, um, in your, uh, in your, in your uh, executed logic get, get cross-loaded. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, the good, th good news is the new 5580 uh, redundant controller manual has a chapter dedicated, chapter six to uh, best practices. So I'd highly recommend um, looking at this chapter before you implement a 5580. Um, we're gonna highlight some of the topics that, um, that are considered best programming practices. And those of you that have done um, L7 redundancy and maybe even L6 redundancy, may, this may be a little bit of a review to you, um, but it will, it will become evident that, um, that this, the programming practices are more important than ever as we start using the 5580 redundant controllers. And we'll get to that in a minute. But at a high level, um, these are the different, um, the, the different best programming practices. And I'll, we'll go over, I'll talk a bit, little bit about these, each one of these. Um, the, first, the first one is to um, utilize periodic tasks instead of continuous tasks. And so that's important for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, number one, the periodic tasks, like, like it's described, uh, run in a, in a set time uh, every time. So you may have 100 millisecond tasks, you may have 250 millisecond tasks. The actual time that it takes to run that logic is likely a lot less than that. So, um, so in so being, uh, if you run the periodic tasks in a redundant system, um, it's not gonna run as fast is, is if you run the same set of logic in a continuous task. And then what that, what that helps with is, um, and, and that, so that, what that means is you're gonna do less cross-loading, uh, you know, per second or, or, or uh, you know, per, per time block if you use periodic tasks instead of continuous tasks. So that's rule number one. 
And that's a, been a best practice you know, for quite a long time, even with simplex systems um, with control logics. So that's, so that's kind of job number one. Um, number two is uh, try to minimize the number of programs. So, and we're not, we're, we're not saying here, we're not saying put everything in one program by any means, but, um, but and this is where, where uh, the best practices may start to diverge a little bit from simplex versus redundancy, because like we said, each cross-loading event happens at least by default after the end of each program. So by definition, the fewer number of programs you have, then the fewer number of cross-loading events that occur um, in the overall um, execution of all your tasks. So that's another one. Um, there's also some some um, some minor details we can talk about here. You can you can decide whether or not you want to do a cross loading at the end of a, a, a particular task. If if you have a task that that that, that uh, doesn't need to be synchronized, then you don't have to cross load at the end of that task. So that can be done programmatically, um, and that's part of uh, what we call optimizing our program execution. So if if there are some programs that maybe you're just gathering data and they don't necessarily need, or they're not, it's not critical data, and they don't need to be um, synchronized, then you can take that default out and that might improve your execution a little bit. Um, so consolidating our code. So there's a few ways we can do that. Um, one of the ways, primary ways is on the, on the data organization. So, um, you're know, using arrays where you can, especially in booleans. So, um, so in, when the when the controller cross loads all the data that's associated uh, with, especially the outputs that are associated with a program task, each each piece of that data gets um, gets uh, uh, what we call a cross loading boundary, which in the fifty five eighty is uh, forty uh, ninety six bytes. And so whether you have one Boolean or whether you use, you're using half of that 40, 96 bytes, that entire block of data gets cross-loaded, um, whether it doesn't matter how much data you're actually using inside of it. So um, if you're creating Booleans and you create individual Boolean tags, a Boolean takes up 32 bytes of data because um, it, it comes in a, in a word inside, inside the controller. So if you use an array of say five or 10 Booleans inside one array, that's the same amount of data as a single Boolean by itself. So, so kind of consolidating your data is kind of the name of the game. Also creating a user to, um, a UDTs, um, user defined data types. Um, that's also a big help because those are then blocked together uh, especially the, and then the, the different data types that are inside the user defined um, type. So that's another way of kind of consolidating and optimizing um, your code. So that's what we call combining data into groups where we can um, and using uh, arrays and structures. Um, the other thing we can do is we can delete unused tags. And so, well, you might say, well, I'm not using the tag, then it doesn't get cross loaded. However, if you leave a lot of them, uh, uh, unused tags inside the controller, your tag database overall is a lot larger than it needs to be. So there's more blocks of data that are unused that are en gonna end up being, uh, being cross-loaded. So it's always a good practice to uh, delete your unused tags. Once you're finished with a program, um, with, with, with the programming, because um, that, will, that will make the uh, system run a lot, a lot more efficiently. So like I said, if you have any you know, more detailed questions about these, we can dive into details on, on almost any of these topics. So uh, just reach out to us um, and uh, as a specialist, we'd be more than happy to help you. So, um, so that kind of leads us into a migration discussion. So um, if you're looking to migrate uh, ex maybe an existing program to a uh, Control Logic 5580 redundancy, maybe you've used Maybe you've got an L6 redundancy that you're migrating or, or you have another older program with the 5570. Um, it's important to, uh, to, you know, to, to use the, uh, the best practices we're talking about. 
but you may have a question of, well, what kind of performance would I expect uh, to get if I migrate an existing project? Well, if you're using our best practices, you should see you know, a pretty much of a one-to-one -one performance comparison. Um, however, if you're not, if, if you're not, you know, if you're not consolidating your data, if, 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 you, if you've got continuous tasks, if you're doing some of these other things, you may see a significant increase in the performance, even from a 5570 uh, redundancy to a 5580. Um, and you may ask why. Well, with the new 5580 controllers, um, you know, they're quad, quad core, they can handle a lot more data uh, bytes at a time. And so, so if you think about cross-loading data, um, in an L7, that cross-loading boundary was only 256 bytes. So what that meant is a 256 byte of data block um, per whatever data was, was, uh, was inside that program. So that could be one Boolean, that could be 200 bytes of, of, of user data um, would be included in the cross-loading boundary. Now in the 5580, that boundary is increased 16 times up to uh, 4096. So, um, so that is good in a simplex system because we're processing more data faster, but because we're, of the way that redundancy works and the synchronization, that's, that could uh, increase our boundary, uh, our, our, our cross-loading time significantly if we don't follow some of these best practices. So, so that's what we're really talking about here. And, and so I think I would recommend anyone that's looking to implement a new 5580 controller, uh, whether it's a new application or an existing, just please keep in mind these best practices of, uh, of making your code as efficient as possible because that will give you a better result um, as, as you complete your project. And this is an example, uh, uh, just a cut out from the manual of, of the, uh, the difference potentially in, in how much data is being used um, in the cross-loading. So, so in a, you know, in a 5570, your, your, your range was either, you know, at, at the most efficient 4,096 up to 256,000 bytes. Um, if your controller is not efficient in its in its data management, you could really be increasing the amount of data that's transferred um, during the cross loading period. Uh, so it's it's really something to keep in mind, um, and we want to make you guys aware, all our customers and, and partners aware of this. Um, and I believe that's the end of our presentation today. So uh, I don't know if we have any questions in the chat, or if there's any comments, I'd be more than happy to address those um, before we sign off. I have not seen any questions um, come in, so we'll give one minute to allow uh, typing in there. Um, did you guys get power back? Well, it's, it's been on. It's, it's on flickered and on and off. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I think they're doing something in the warehouse, but, but anyway, just, so just to recap too, uh, I don't know if we mentioned it or not, on the 5580 redundancy, be sure you're uh, using version 33 of Studio 5000. Uh, that is the first version that supports the 5580 redundancy. Um, and it's been out for about eight months now. So we feel like we've got a pretty good, pretty, pretty solid uh, version out there. Okay, um, looks like no questions. So we'll close out our session. Mike, David, thanks for the presentation. Uh, once again, this will be posted to the YouTube channel. These slides will be made available also on the, um, the user group archive page, which is all at reynoldsonline.com. So the slides will be available. If you uh, can't find them, uh, as we've mentioned many times, reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to share them with you. So thanks for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thanks, everybody.